Good afternoon or good morning, everyone here in the US, and good evening or good night to those of you who are joining us from elsewhere. My name is Tun Shen. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and also the deputy director of the Sakup Sabanja Center for Turkish Studies here at Columbia University. It's a distinct pleasure and honor for me to welcome you all to the second panel of the film series our center is organizing this academic year. And today, with our distinguished guests, we will have a conversation over Nuri Bilge Ceylan's award-winning Winter Sleep. Today is also a very special day for Turkey. As an institute devoted to Turkish studies, we would like to celebrate the 98th anniversary of the founding of the Turkish Republic. Before handing the podium over to my esteemed colleague and Sakıp Sabancı visiting professor of Turkish studies, Zeynep Çelik, I would like to say a few words of thanks. First, to Sakıp Sabancı family. It's thanks to them we have this wonderful center here in New York at Columbia University and organize events to promote Turkish studies. I would also like to thank the staff of the Sakıp Sabancı Center and Global Center Istanbul for making these panels possible. I would finally like to thank everybody in the audience for being with us today and encourage you to join us for the Q&A session. Now I'm passing, it, passing the floor to Professor Çelik. Thank you, Tunç, and welcome everybody. How does one introduce Nuri Bilge Ceylan? As you all know, he is one of the world's leading film directors with a lineup of highly acclaimed award-winning movies. Among them in reverse chronological order, The Wild Pear Tree, Once Upon a Time in Anatolia, Three Monkeys, Climate and Distant. There are others. As we impatiently wait for his next film, Kuro Otlar Üstünde, On Dry Grass, we will focus today on his Khan Pandor winning masterpiece, Winter Sleep, 2014. At this point, I would like to convey Orhan Pamuk's regrets for not being able to join us due to an urgent medical issue. We will, of course, miss him, but we are privileged to have other distinguished guests, two eminent New York film critics. Richard Pena and Stuart Clowens. Professor Shen and I will also take part in the conversation, albeit as humble cultural historians. Dear members of the audience, please add your voices to the discussion during the Q&A session. Richard Pena is Professor of Film and Media Studies at Columbia University. He was the director of the New York Film Festival from 1988 to 2012, where he presented a number of films by Nuri Bilge Ceylan. Stuart Clowens was the film critic for The Nation magazine for 32 years. He has also written for many other publications and had the honor of serving on the selection committee of the New York Film Festival under Richard Pena. He has been an adjunct faculty member in the film division of Columbia School of the Arts. His new book about Preston Sturges is forthcoming from Columbia University Press. I would like to start out with a question to Stuart Clowens. In a review in The Nation, you described winter sleep as visually overwhelming and urged your readers to watch it on a real screen. You brought up the richness of the interior views as well as the exterior ones, which in your words, unfold like a Chinese scroll. Could you elaborate a bit more on this issue and perhaps situate the film's visual power in reference to other comparable films? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, even more, thank you for inviting me to participate. I'm, I'm really honored and feel very privileged, privileged to be able to, to join in this, this discussion today. Um, 
perhaps um, Winter Sleep was one of the last um, really big screen films uh, to, um, to, to emerge in, in the art house um, before film changed entirely and the only thing on big screens was the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, we, we are now in, a, in an era that's much different from the one in which uh, Chelan emerged as a filmmaker. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit. Um, but clearly, Winter Sleep is an incredibly rich film visually. Um, it would be possible for another filmmaker to take that landscape, that utterly extraordinary landscape, and and make um, something something impressive out of it, um, but it takes a special talent to see that landscape in a particular way, and build that landscape into the interior scenes and build the interior scenes into the landscape. Uh, and one of the remarkable things about the film is how well integrated those two aspects of the film are. Um, it's notable that Ceylon doesn't begin with, with a big panoramic, panoramic view of the landscape. He begins with the view of mist, fog rising from, from the ground close up. He starts with something very elemental. He starts, with, he starts with the earth, he starts with vegetation, he starts with the sense of moisture. It's only after that that you get a panoramic view but the panoramic view is complicated because of the little figure of the man you will come to know as Aiden walking along slowly. Um, so it, it's, it's approaches like that that give the film its power. And this carries over also to the interior scenes where he very characteristically um, in dialogue scenes, long dialogue scenes um, will run through most of the scene without an establishing shot. He'll have the characters talking with each other. He'll cross cut between them. At the end of the scene, suddenly the camera is back and you see the whole room and you get the sense of where everybody is. And sometimes you have a sense of the outside through a window, sometimes you don't. But um, it's, it's that canniness that he brings to it. Um, it's it's that special touch that gives the film so much power, I, I, I think. Um, but I've carried on much too long about this and I defer to others now. Yes, actually, Stuart, uh, watching the film again to prepare for today, uh, I was really struck by the interiors and just how thoughtfully planned and designed they all are. But that in a certain way, makes the fact that he doesn't perhaps use the exteriors more, which are so remarkable, seem um, to use a word very lightly, a little almost perverse in a way, because uh, I at least wanted to see more. Can I ask both Zeynep and Tunch, what are these landscapes and how do they figure perhaps in the Turkish imagination? Because they really are quite extraordinary. Um, the film takes place in uh, Cappadocia, which is perhaps the most touristic region of the country. And we are used to seeing photographs of the place with the balloons of all colors and in bright sunlight. Whereas what we watch in this movie is a very, I don't think we see the sunlight. It's always in the dark and uh, with fog and really a depressing sort of um, environment. It is, of course, very striking. But I heard in an interview Jaylan say that he looked for um, an untouristic place but he needed a hotel which would be all open in winter and he couldn't find one except for this area. So he tried very hard, he said, to make this not as touristic as it really is. But Tunch may have some other things to add. Well, I also read the same interview that Professor Celik refers to now. 
Uh, he was a little bit hesitant, I uh, suppose, to use Cappadocia as his main landscape. But the other alternative was uh, one of the touristic places in the seaside, close to Asian and in Mediterranean, and they really didn't want that to happen. So they ended up uh, having Cappadocia uh, to uh, uh, have a character with a, with a hotel that is open to tourists. Uh, but I think he, I mean, Nurebilge Jailan has certain reservations uh, with the use of Cappadocia as his landscape. And in terms of the use of interiors, I think, uh, again, I'm referring here to the same interview he gave to one of the uh, magazines in, in Turkey. Uh, I mean, he didn't use uh, studios in his earlier films, uh, and he kind of expressed his regret not to do that before. Uh, so he used all the, um, um, you know, uh, the possibilities the use of studio gives to him. And he was so happy with it as far as that the same interview is concerned. Stuart, you alluded before to the idea of the film and Ceylon within kind of the flow of contemporary cinema. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, he emerges at really the... Uh, turn of the century and very quickly is established as a, a festival favorite and is seen as an important new voice. Can you put him in, con in a context that would include everyone from an Abbas Kiaristami to a Ho Shao Shen to any number of newer filmmakers? Um, sure, I'll try. Um, and as I failed, you'll jump in and help me, okay? Um, I, one way to look at this is to say that uh, Ceylon emerged between two new waves, um, between the Iranian new wave and the Romanian new wave. He emerged, it's, it's funny, he emerged both chronologically and geographically between these two. <laughs> and the Iranian new wave had already peaked in a way. Um, the, you know, the, the filmmakers who, who would best identified with it by the time Ceylon arrived, they were stepping back a little. The Romanian new wave hadn't come there yet. He came in the middle and he wasn't part of a new wave, which is interesting and worth talking about. And we could even talk about why people look to new waves and what that means. But he didn't seem to be part of a new wave. He was just himself from the start. Um, with the Iranian new wave, there was a lot of landscape in, in those films, um, a, a love of landscape, uh, a tremendous sense of place. Um, the Iranian filmmakers were not able to make films, though, about subjects such as sexual unhappiness and explicit films about political corruption. They could hint at a few things, but they couldn't really go into those subjects. Um, also, those films were noted notable for being slow cinema, as it's come to be known. There, there was no hurry. When the Romanians came in, they were also doing slow cinema. They were doing lots of sexual unhappiness and frustration, lots of political corruption, no landscape at all. Uh, with the Romanians, what you were gonna get was very much present tense. It was all what's right here, right now. With the Iranians, with this, it, so there was no depth in a sense to, to the Romanian new wave. With the Iranian film, there was tremendous depth because the landscape wasn't just a physical landscape. You had the sense of the culture and history that was implicit in that landscape. Ceylon comes in and he's kind of in the middle of that. He is making deliberate slow cinema. He's taking his time. He's letting things build up. He's giving you, even in his urban films, you get the sense of an urban landscape that has real depth to it. Um, physical depth, psychological depth. And he's got, he's got the blood in his veins that you, would get later in the Romanian films, but not so much in the Iranian films. So I, I would just lay that out as a beginning. I don't know if that's helpful. 
Richard, you're smiling as oh, if I've just made a complete fool of myself. No, don't be silly, Stuart. That's ex I think it's enormously interesting to place his work in between these two new waves as you as you turn them. In fact, Ceylon has been very open in what I've read about him and also in conversation that I've had with him about the influence of Abbas Kiarostami, that Kiarostami was a great influence on his work. But one of the things that I admire is if you look at an early film like Clouds of May and then, you, you know, his other works, it's as if he took that influence and progressively made it his own cinema, where the traces yeah. of Kiarostami get fainter and fainter, although one could say the ethos remains. There's a, a sense in which the, the interaction of the landscape with the human characters continues to be an enormous part of his work. So, no, I think that's uh, very, very helpful. Can I ask uh, Zainab and Tunch now to maybe bring it a little more specifically into where Ceylon fits in contemporary Turkey. As I mentioned before we started, when I was in Turkey a few years ago, I was pleasantly surprised and maybe a little shocked to see full length cardboard cutout images of Ceylon in bookstores because one of his books of photographs had just come out. It was clearly an event. You know, people were talking about it and he seems fairly well known, at least among the people I was speaking to. Can you place Ceylon in a contemporary uh, Turkish cultural setting? You want to start, Tunj? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, he's uh, definitely um, a famous figure. Uh, I mean, and especially after the carnivores uh, from the 1999 on, I think that maybe 2001, I mean, uh, I'm not so sure about the uh, exact dates, but the Khan Award uh, he received, or Khan Awards he received, obviously put him in, on the radar of uh, everyone in Turkey. But uh, when you look at uh, how many people actually go to cinemas to watch his movies, we can't really see the exact number uh, there. I mean, uh, less than maybe uh, 100,000 people in, on average usually watch uh, his movies in um, the cinema uh, hall, movie halls. Um, and he's often um, defined as the leader of the art house cinema. Uh, who is not mm -hmm. always appealing to, um, to, let's say, the masses or uh, the popular, popular culture. Uh, but everyone knows Nuri Bilge Ceylan and what he means for uh, Turkish culture and Turkish cinema. That's my two cents, actually. <laughs> I agree with Tunç entirely. I'm in no position to really evaluate his reception in Turkey, but I've seen his movies in Istanbul only in very small theaters to very small audiences who were mesmerized. So I would say that he does have a very um, uh, faithful following in Turkey. I do not think we're talking about millions. Mm -hmm. And he is not uh, unhappy, I think, with that. And he uh, totally came to terms with it. Uh, he knows that his movies are not for everyone or for, uh, for a, a culture that is really accustomed to watching Hollywood movies or, you know, um, uh, Marvel uh, studio movies. Um, so I think he is totally okay with <laughs> that well, level of Furthermore, he does not make himself too accessible. And that's to his credit. He is not on television every day. He is, he's a very uh, elusive intellectual character that way. Mm -hmm. And I think he gains a lot of respect for being like this. Mm -hmm. Beyond cinema, of course, I'm wondering if you see Ceylon in dialogue with people from literature or other other arts. And we'll be talking. My next few questions actually will be about theater, which is such an interesting concern of the film. Ooh, this is difficult again for for me to answer. Um, but yes, I, well, some of his actors are also engaged in theater. Obviously, Haluk Bilginer, 
uh, who is a great, great, great theater actor. As we speak, I think he's doing King Lear on stage in Turkey. Um, and his involvement in uh, different aspects of acting is really is, uh, very, very interesting. Furthermore, there is that line that he utters in the movie. He's, they call him a, pl a player. And he says, no, 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 I'm an oyuncu deyinim, I'm not a player, I am an actor, and there's a big difference. And he dumps on the series on, on television there. So uh, it is a very engaged, uh, interwoven relationship we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Again, he's very well, Jaygan is extremely well respected, as we all understand understand it and we should perhaps add that the for our first discussion on ethos which was a tv series um carries a lot of influence by jaylan may, may i ask a, a question here sure, um, please. because uh, following on what richard was asking um something else that I think distinguishes Chelan's work is, is that there is this, this literary substratum of it. And he's made films, it, it's, it strikes me, um, Aiden in this film is a would-be writer. The main character in The Wild Pear Tree is a would-be writer. Um, do you see anything particular in, 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 in Turkish culture where that, that would relate to, uh, to these characters of would-be writers, this, this, des this desire to, to, to write. And um, I, I can mention that uh, Pamuk's books also have such figures in them. I wish we had Pamuk here today. <laughs> I'm sure we had lots of questions to ask him, especially make connections between his uh, novel Snow and Nuri Bilge Ceylan's movies. Yes. There are particular similarities um, between certain characters. Uh, but for your specific question, uh, Mr. Clovens, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that it's a pretty common thing as, uh, as a character. I mean, it echoes well for Nuri Bilge Ceylan's own personal biography, maybe. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, people who would like to be a writer uh, who would like to prove themselves in the intellectual landscape of Turkey. I mean, uh, it is not that common as a thing, I should, I should say. I see. I see. One thing that struck me is the, one of the last shots that we get in the film, we have uh, Ayat at his typewriter, and it seems as if he's beginning a history of Turkish theater. And placing that shot so prominently at the end that, of course, the whole screen is white and we just see him typing those words makes me wonder if it becomes almost a reflection back on the three hours that we've just <laughs> witnessed, um, three hours in which theatricality defined as we would like to define it, uh, is certainly something that runs through much of what we see. Uh, and I've always been interested in what different directors do with the notion of theater. And here, I think it works not only in terms of the structure of a certain kind of dialogue, and the film is full of very long and interesting dialogue sequences, but also in the fact that it seems to me that all of these characters are very much uh, living a kind of theater. Again, watching the film again, I, I was really struck by how much dissembling goes on in the film, how much people pretend to be doing something that they know they're not doing, that they're acting out. And even at one point, uh, his sister says this thing, well, I did this to make him do that, even though I didn't really believe in this. And I think if the wife answers, you've been watching too many soap operas, you know? So there is some aspect where theater infects not only in the form of it, but in the very way that these characters relate to each other. I would, I would say that this goes beyond even the, the quote unquote intellectual characters. There's, there's the remarkable and horrifying scene in which the Islamic teacher brings the young boy for the staged scene of apologizing. And the boy is supposed to cooperate. Aiden is pretending that he doesn't want to have his hand kissed, but he's 
putting the hand up there anyway, making sure that it's right there available, waiting for it. The boy does not cooperate. The, the, the play fails, but... <clears throat> But even but even in that scene with the Islamic teacher, there's there's this attempt to stage something. And there's a wonderful moment at the beginning when we have the first scene with the Islamic teacher that after being, to my mind, very subservient, you know, and really kind of you know apologizing and pro practically groveling, he walks away and curses them under his breath. At which point, every encounter with them after that. I sort of look as double-edged, that none of it's sincere, that you know he's trying to get what he can. Oh yeah, that strange smile of his that that that's always there. I mean, you can just you can feel the tension in his throat as he's keeping his mouth like that. Mm -hmm. I think behind all this, there is a a, a very subtle class issue that's injected here and there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Maybe we could talk a little bit about this. And that brings the specificity of uh, the Turkish context, I think. Yes. Who is, in fact, Ayad? I mean, or Aiden, rather, I'm sorry. Who is he in terms of a Turkish audience watching? Would they immediately be able to identify this is somebody from this kind of family, this kind of class? I mean, you know, as as it as the film goes on, it you know, one thinks that he's richer and richer. That he's probably quite a wealthy person, you know. Uh, but that's not the first impression you get. But I mean, as time goes on and you learn more things, you hear that. So indeed, as you say, Zainab, uh, classes, you know, from the very beginning, inscribed in his encounters with that family. Even the name of the character tells a lot, actually, for especially Turkish-speaking audience. I'm not sure whether uh, um, it was related to you when you first watched the movie, but the term Aydın uh, means uh, enlightened figure or intellectual who <laughs> kind of takes all the responsibility of enlightening the masses. Uh, so it's a pretty loaded term, I should say, uh, in the broader history of Turkish modernization. I mean, there are many novels uh, written on the question of the Aydın, uh, the, the intellectual and the Turkish intellectual and the responsibilities he or she has in order to modernize um, the masses. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, Nuri Bilge Ceylan was happy with the use of that name for his protagonist. I think I saw uh, in some of his interviews that he later regretted uh, to use it uh, just because it was a pretty loaded term for especially Turkish speaking people. And it kind of, it's so uh, evident what he really uh, means by that. And it kind of reduces to watch the movie as just an allegory of Turkish politics or Turkish society, which I believe uh, Nuri Bilge Ceylan uh, wouldn't prefer, right? He probably wouldn't like his movie to be only watched as just an allegory of Turkish society. But the use of name Aydın, I think, feeds that uh, understanding. Well, I think you're right, Tunç. It's also interesting that the women's names are not like that. They're old names, they're traditional names, even though they are modern women, they're entitled women. Um, so Aydın makes him stick out. He is such an interesting character. There's nothing likable about him. And watching, watching him, I... Both of all these men I did not like, who are condescending, who are pretentious, who are failures, who are, you name it, they're the centers of the world. Um, and at this point, I am wondering whether in all these dialogues and character building, um, there is a big role played by um, Muri Bilge Ceylan's wife, Ebru Ceylan. Um, I read these Chekhov stories. They follow the line pretty uh, closely, but then there is something there that is totally new. 
And I am wondering how much uh, Ebru Jalan's um, creativity or intelligence or sensibility went into those dialogues that helped to form the characters mm -hmm. so powerfully. You, usually, I mean, here I am the woman speaking, but usually women's roles are buried uh, in their collaborations mm -hmm. with their mm -hmm. uh, husbands. Mm -hmm. Well, it is one of the sad facts of film history that um, that movement that was called or is called auteurism, which really focuses attention on the director, uh, at times very unfairly leaves out what we know were the very significant contributions of screenwriters, uh, who sometimes, of course, are also the partners of the of the filmmakers, the female partners of the male filmmakers. You could think of Taya von Harbo with Fritz slang, or you could think of Alma Ravel with Alfred Hitchcock. And here, we don't know exactly what the precise contribution of Ebru Ceylon was. Uh, we were joking before about it would be so interesting if she wrote all the female parts of the dialogues and he wrote all the male ones. That would be a, a great way to learn more about their relationship. But anyway, we don't have that information at hand. Uh, there is so many ways to, there are so many ways to analyze um, Aiden. As you mentioned, class is obviously a very important one. And I think those scenes, you know, with the family who might get thrown out of their house are, are clearly in that. There's something I'm sure we'll, I we'll hope we'll talk about, which is the gender relationship relationship between, of course, uh, Aiden and his wife. But I want to ask another question, which is watching the film again, I also had the sense that the conflict between um, the wife and uh, Aiden is actually a generational conflict as well, that, you know, there's really quite a difference in age, and that, in fact, Aiden belongs to another generation of let's call them Turkish intellectuals, Turkish, you know, progressives, and the wife belongs to a very different one. And it's interesting to see that conflict play out. Uh, it's something I've noticed in other countries too. Sometimes the difference of about 20 years, people are enormously different in terms of the way that they see social problems, they see social solutions. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Anybody? <laughs> Well, I'm not so sure whether it's because of the uh, social realities in Turkey or he just wanted to follow uh, the, uh, the, the plot in Chekhov's uh, story in Wife, which is also the case, right? There is a kind of a generational gap between, uh, um, between the husband and wife there, although that generational gap maybe is not that big as it's uh, the case in um, uh, The Winter Sleep. But... Uh, not so sure about um, its uh, resonance with the uh, current social realities in Turkey. Maybe I, did, of, yeah. I did not see her as representative of her generation so much. But I saw her, and maybe this is one thing I did not uh, appreciate so much. I saw her as being defined only in terms of Aydın. And I wondered where she was behind that. She was oppositional. She disagreed with them a lot, but I did not really understand her, who she was. Mm -hmm. Well, I think my, my question about generation comes from the fact that we see her actually interacting with the people who she would like to help. I mean, with the teacher, with that group who comes to the hotel and whatever, there's a way she seems to be involved directly, whereas he prefers to stay in the background and occasionally just give money. And I, I felt that to me seemed a very powerful difference between the two of them in terms of, again, what their relationship to these people might be. And in fact, in the end, she makes that extraordinary gesture by going to the house and giving them money to the uh, Islamic teacher that later gets burned up in the uh, fireplace. But that might be also related to uh, her taking every opportunity to escape from Aydın, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, getting close to the teacher, other people in the town is just another opportunity for her to uh, put some distance between her and uh, and Aydın. Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, these things are obviously wrapped up together, so they're hard to mm-hmm. separate, you know, the gender issue with, you know, perhaps the other issue, if indeed it's there. Stuart, you were going to say something. I'm sorry we interrupted. No, not at all. Uh, I was just going to say with, with Zainab that I feel that there's a mystery to this character. It's never explained how she wound up marrying this man to begin with. I mean, she's a very beautiful woman, so one imagines she might have been on the stage. Maybe she was maybe she was in a production with him at some point, maybe when he was more of an actor that that and, and seemed like more of a the grand man that he pretends to be now with his big overcoat. Maybe he was, you know, maybe he seemed like a good deal at the time, but but it's never defined where she comes into this. And though it's clear throughout the film uh, that they're living parallel lives, they're not really living together. It's only much later in the film when you find out she's got her own rooms. I mean, he's got his study, what he calls a study. He's got his little house by himself. You find out later she's got entirely her own room. This is her place. It's her space. She does not go in there except toward the end for this terrible conversation. Um, so there is a mystery to it. I, who exactly is she? Um, and and why doesn't she get away? Because the sister finally does. Her story is also pretty mysterious. I mean, the sister's mm-hmm. story in Ejla. I mean, yes, yeah. Yeah. we don't really know what happened to her, where he, she really went or, you know, it, uh, it wasn't a really smooth transition as far as I'm concerned, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. No, it's not, but it's part of what I, I see as the big narrative movement in this film, which is an emptying out. What happens in this film is it empties out. Mm-hmm. The guests leave, no more guests, and the sister leaves, and the wild horse sent out, and finally Aiden himself, he's supposed to go, but he doesn't. And the one who's stuck there, the one who's left, the one who can't get away is the wife, right? Um, but, you know, as, as, as winter gets deeper and deeper, it gets emptier and emptier. That's, to me, the movement of the film. Um, and the sister's departure, which is unannounced, which you can't say it's sudden because they've talked about it for about 45 minutes solid. But so there's nothing, there's, there's nothing sudden there, but the discovery that she's gone, that is sudden. Yeah. Can I ask all of you actually to talk about that? That was you know, my, one of my next questions, to talk about the scene of uh, Aiden leaving. And when he announces very grandly, he's going to Istanbul and things like that. How do you read that? Do you think he ever really was going to leave? I mean, it's it, as I think Stuart was saying, there's something so weird about the fact that he kind of makes this grand gesture of leaving and then doesn't at all. Um, how do you all react to that? There's so much ambiguity there. He goes to the train station. And in that very awkward moment when his help helper, his butler, just slides. And of course, it's another one of these awkward class references there. Um, and then he goes back uh, again. Um, the, um, in the in the original story, the same thing happens. He goes to the to the character, goes to the train station, and then goes back to his friend's house. So I could not make any sense of whether he really wanted to go to Istanbul or not. Um, I, I don't know how, what the others think, and I'd be very. Curious. I think that ambiguity also enhances the narrative here. Uh, you can't be sure whether he really wanted to go or he really wanted to stay. So playing with that ambiguity is also a, a, a tool for, I guess, enhancing the narrative. So I was also uh, indifferent how to interpret that scene, whether he really wanted to go or uh, he wanted to stay. Part of me thinks that that perhaps going to Istanbul, he would be just someone else, you know, no one. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this kingdom, he's the king, you know, and that in a certain way, that seems to be perhaps what he uh, doesn't want to do. Stuart, again, I stepped on your your, uh, answer. 
Oh, no, no, not at all. And and I, I agree completely with you. If he went back to Istanbul, he'd be nobody. <laughs> he would be <laughs> nobody. Um, um, he'd be worse than a nobody. He'd be a has-been. Um, but to the point about the scene in the train station and the ambiguity, um, the the sense of improvisation, the sense of not of ambivalence, not having made up of the mind, comes across to me through the it's it's a moment of slapstick when his butler just falls on the floor. It's it's pure Buster Keaton when that happens. It's followed by Aiden coming in, not helping the man. He goes to the stove. The, the butler is wet, he's cold, he's on the floor. The butler has to go to the cashier and find out if the train is coming. Aiden is going over to the stove, he's fine. Right? Um, but the, the sense of contingency, the things happen in a slipshod way. Things happen because they happen, because things are falling apart and it's just it's just happenstance. This this comes through a little because of this moment of slapstick. And also the the absurd dialogue uh, is the train coming? Yes, the train is definitely coming, probably. Half an hour, hour the most, you know. <laughs> Just want to remind everybody that if uh, people who are listening in, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A function. I see that we have a few of them and we'll get yeah. to them in a while. But uh, if you could have any questions, make sure you just put them in there. Um, could I ask um, all of you about the role of music here? Oh. Because it is very effective. And Stuart, you wrote about this. Mm -hmm. I, I did write about it. It is very effective. I think that if you did not have at the beginning that Dolly shot up to the back of Aiden's head with the Schubert playing, you would have no sympathy for this man at all. I think that you get sympathy for this man. He's not an unbearable character, largely because of the music, mm -hmm. largely because of that. There is... Chelan imparts a soul to him. I, I should also say that it's very risky to use that music. I know of it's only one other instance of it's being used that was Bresson's Oazar Baltazar. He used the same piece. You shouldn't follow Bresson doing something. It's really, <laughs> he just, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, so it was nervy of Chelan to use the same music, the same sense of mournfulness that you get from, you know, from, from that. But I think that's what I think that's what softens um, Aiden's character. That's what gives you some sense of you know to have some sympathy for this man. And it is only that music that he uses, right? If I remember correctly, until the very end, there's a little patch of other music at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. It's great to see a contemporary director who doesn't overload his film with music. It's uh, a rare achievement nowadays to sort of uh, just get away from that temptation. Um, people talk a lot about, obviously, the literary influences. Uh, Zeynep, you've mentioned uh, the Chekhovian influence, which obviously is there. And even beyond the stories, it has such a Chekhovian feel the entire thing. But uh, the critic Jonathan Romney and his sight and sound review, I thought made an interesting observation said, well, of course, there's, you know, Chekhov and Dostoevsky, even Shakespeare, but maybe we should be talking about Sartre, because if any film ever revealed hell is other people, it's this one. Responses. I agree with you. I uh... <laughs> I hadn't thought of it, but the fact that for this man, everybody is a problem. He can't form a dial, he cannot, and okay, let me step back here. I was so annoyed at him as a character. There wasn't one conversation he wouldn't win. He would always have the last words. Whether it's with his sister, of course, with the imam, it's easy, or with, his, with the teacher, the poor teacher who wanted to recite something from Shakespeare, and he got back at it with even a better one. Uh, why am I saying this? Does this answer his uh, attitude toward other people? Unless he's on top, 
he does he's not interested in that that's probably why he doesn't really want to go back to istanbul you know <laughs> he wouldn't have the last word there no he wouldn't <laughs> And he is very aware of this. And here, this is when he becomes very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps, as Stuart said, the music uh, makes him vulnerable too. Uh, mm -hmm. He knows he's a failed person. He knows if his mother, if his parents did not leave him the money, he would be nobody. Mm -hmm. And he knows that he's getting older and older. His, his friend talks to him about that mass suicide on your hairline. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> he knows he's getting older. His wife is still young and beautiful, and he is really, he's not going to be able to carry off that overcoat much longer. <laughs> <You know? laughs> My last question is about the scene that for me was most surprising in the film, and that was the hunt. It just seemed, you know, when I was watching the film, I thought, where does this come from? It was very, but again, a very interesting scene that it, what I love about it is in a certain way, Yes, you could probably cut it right out of the film and it might not make a difference. But on the other hand, it seems to have a lot of resonance. So often with Ceylon, you know, while these are story films, they're not narrative films in the strict sense. They seem to be an accumulation of scenes rather than a kind of continuum of scenes. And this seemed to me a very good example of that. So how do you all react to the hunt? That it's very well prepared, actually. I, I've been trying to remember exactly where it comes, but there is a shot of the ground earlier on where there's a small dead animal, not much larger than a rabbit lying on the ground. Um, uh, he sees that when he's at the there. train station. Yeah. Ah, there you go. That's when he's going to the train station. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the ground literally has been prepared for this. Um, and it all then the hunt prepares the way for the finale handing something dead to the to the cook at the end here take this with his wife trapped up there behind the window that's that in a way says it all here <laughs> dead thing deal with it i wonder whether that hunt scene could also be considered together with the horse scene Oh yes, uh, yes. I also had a had a difficult time, uh, you know, understanding how that horse scene. Well, actually, scenes because there are two or three different uh, particular uh, parts where uh, they hunted the horse and then he set it free, and whether this mm -hmm. uh, ties with the, the final hunt scene. So I'd like to hear um, your thoughts on this, actually. Well, the, the movie begins as a search to acquire a horse. Mm -hmm. You might think that this is a movie about uh, a guy running a hotel wanting to get a horse because his guests want it. That's, that's where it begins. That's the story you would think where we start. Then it turns into the story of evicting these poor people, though he's pretending he's not doing it. It's none of my business. Then it turns into the story of this very difficult relationship with two women you know, people say that this is a very long, leisurely film that takes too much time, but there's such concision in the scene where the boy is brought to apologize and faints. There is a cut from the boy fainting to a cut of the wife's face, horrified, to a cut of their chasing down the horse. Within about five seconds, all these things come together. So it's impossible for me not to think of the story of the boy and what the boy is going through in the story of this wild horse that's captured. That's, the horse gets set free, the boy, not so much. Mm -hmm. But that's, yeah, and in the that wife, way, not at all. In that way, it seems to me that the film is a good example of something I see in, to my mind, a lot of the most interesting filmmakers nowadays, which is works that are not certainly not non-narrative but are very loosely narrative that they would rather have a number of scenes and ideas 
movements almost in a musical sense and then have them bounce off each other in a certain way rather than just following a story i mean this isn't the story of you know a few days in the life of Aiden, you know, I mean, this is really a series of propositions that then bounce off each other, you know, everything having to do with politics, to gender, to class, to religion, to many other things, to art. Yeah, I was thinking, Richard, that the that the way the film moves, it's as if he's, he starts out with the stream and then it splits into branches. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the, the narrative splits into branch streams and some that sometimes they, circle back they touch each other again but mm -hmm. it's it's diffuse in that way and it made me think that turkey is the country that gave us the word meander so <laughs> maybe it's appropriate that these streams wander off and then come back together right that's great uh, great way of uh, great image for it Stuart. thank you before turning to questions from our audience, can I ask one last and personal kind of question? When Absolutely. did Ilya Jaylan cinema get your attention first? Do you remember? I, I can say in my case that um, I, I'm almost sure it was at the Berlin Film Festival that I saw his first, I, I don't know if it was, I think it was his first film, Kazba. And I was impressed by it. You know, I, Tur uh, Berlin uh, has always been a very good place to see Turkish cinema because of, again, the large Turkish community. The festival, I think, has always tried to have a good presence of Turkish films. So, you know, one of the pleasures of going to that festival was trying to catch up on what was happening in Turkey. And uh, then the next film, Clouds of May, I think that was at Cannes. But uh, whatever, I remember I saw it and I liked it and my colleagues liked it. And we put it in the new directors, new films program that Lincoln Center does together with MoMA. And after that, I mean, you know, often what happens is once we find the director and we like him, we certainly are paying attention to his new work. And then Distant came. And that really, I think, was the crossover film. I think that's the film that people began to say, there's this artist named Nuri Bilge Ceylan who's doing really interesting work. And and after that, I mean, while I was in the festival, you know, I was happy that uh, every few years we could show a new film by Nuri because indeed his art just kept on developing, getting deeper. You know, as I mentioned, the thing with Kiarostami, it was he started off there, but he didn't remain there. You know, it was sort of like an inspiration. It was the catalyst. And then he took it, you know, where he was going to go. I also have a tiny question, which has been bothering, well, not bothering, but it has been <laughs> on my mind. And I'd like to ask both Stuart and Richard Pena if they saw any traces of Yilmaz Güney in this movie, in the characters. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm going to have to pass on that one, Zainab. I, I, I really don't know what to say about that one. Richard, you? Uh, you know, my, my, my answer would be that the Gune that I know best, he just talks about a very different world, much more rural, um, different class. I mean, it's hard to imagine a character like Aiden in a, in a whatchamacallit, a Gune film. You know, it's just, he didn't really look at that world. Uh, so I don't really see that much between them. Although, of course, he's the other palm uh, gold, golden palm winner from Turkey. So, uh, no, I, I, you know, it'd be I interesting. I'm sure there are people who could talk about this more coherently, but I don't really see a big connection between them. I wonder more about that generation that was active in the, uh, in the 80s, people like Atif Yilmaz and whatever, I, I, I think there's more of a connection uh, to that work than I think there is to uh, going back to someone like Gune. I was thinking of characters. I was thinking of the boy and especially yeah. the boy's father. Because mm -hmm. there I saw a little homage to Gune and I was wondering oh. if I was over reading that Ismail was his name, right? Yeah, Ismail. Ismail, oh, yeah. whether in him there was a bit of the old Gune. Mm -hmm. That class-based anger kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Although I can't imagine a Gune character ever throwing all that money in the fire. That, that's, I think no, 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 a, bridge no. too, a bridge too far for Gune. <laughs> a bridge too Dostoevsky for uh, Gune. Well, this has been great. I'm going to open it now because we don't have all that much time left to the questions. And 
these things. Uh, Stuart, let me throw this one to you from Alif Goulez. Uh, Ceylon often states during interviews, he does not care much about the story as much as he cares about atmosphere. What are your thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are that you always um, are cautious when you listen to an artist talk about his or her work. Um, they, they, they always cover their traces. Yeah, they're, they're, he does care a lot about atmosphere. The, the, the mere fact that he's got a film called Climates, um, and Climates is about climates for sure. Uh, that, yes, he cares a lot about that. I, as, I, as I was trying to say at the beginning, I think that the way he infuses the, the the characters' conflicts within this atmosphere is something that that really sets him apart in a, in a way. Um, he doesn't care about building plots as such, though he uses plots. Three Monkeys, for example, has a very complicated plot. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of melodrama, in fact. But but yes, he, he's always very concerned with with the atmosphere, with the setting. Um, and one of the things that, that makes him such a wonderful filmmaker is, is, is this tremendous talent of evoking those, those settings. So I, I hope that's, that's helpful. Maybe somebody else wants to comment on it. No. Okay, maybe we'll just go on to another question. Um, this was actually for uh, Zeynep and for Tunch. Uh, people who wanted uh, both of you, since you would be much more uh, able to answer this, if you could talk a little bit more about the question of class in the film. I mean, it is very strong, but we'd love to hear both your takes. Uh, you both mentioned it, but if we could go a little more deeply into that issue. Uh, I mean, Professor Shelley said that it, there was a kind of subtle, uh, there was a kind of subtle class issue, but I'm not sure whether it was that subtle. Maybe it was uh, more evident uh, and obvious due to the particular social backgrounds of the characters. But I had also another question. I mean, if we are to view this film as a kind of window into the class struggle, how well represented were those characters from um, the lower classes? I mean, we know much about Aydin. We know lots about uh, his wife and sister. Uh, but what do we really know about um, Hidayat, for instance, his assistant, or or the Imam or the Ismail? Um, I mean, I, uh, I have questions about um, uh, how well represented these different people from different class backgrounds uh, in the movie. It's interesting that in the <laughs> questions, there are a few which focus on the child as <laughs> representative of the other class. So I wonder if that means something, but I, Otherwise, I think this class business comes from the, um, the upper class. And there are some very memorable instances there. For example, there was one phrase, what was it? The aesthetic misery of poverty. When he goes to visit that house, the house of the Imam and his family, he's disgusted with the way they're living, the aesthetic misery of poverty. They don't know how to live properly. Or when the sister talks about the maid breaking the fine china, which wasn't even family china. It, she, she had bought it from Chukurjuma, the um, uh, antique dealers in Istanbul. But um, so I think the way these punctuate the movie at certain places uh, makes them very effective to convey the class uh, issue. But perhaps we're focusing too much on it. Perhaps it's the individual's angst that we should be focusing more on. Well, I, I think that the class issue is absolutely there. And I'm glad that people are asking about the, the boy because um, I, I, I agree with you, Tunch, the, the, 
the characters from the impoverished class are not as well developed, but much of what you know about the poverty comes from thinking about this boy and the very poor, inadequate school that he's going to. And in, in the final confrontation, there is the boy trying to do his math homework um, at home, and you know that you know that he's struggling. And you also see that he's a serious student, but you've known all through this film, the school is of no is is really, really falling apart. Um, it it a lot of that comes out through the boy. And it was kind of strange to me that he wanted to be a policeman. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's not strange to me at all. <laughs> he's, he's not going to be beaten up like his father was. He'll be yeah, the one to do the beating up, okay? <laughs> uh, Melis Behlil has a correction for the numbers of uh, spectators for uh, Nuri Bilge Ceylan movies in Turkey. By the way, we're going to host Melis uh, Behlil in... Uh, a little less than a month uh, to, to speak about Yilmaz Güney's hope. Uh, so as she says, the Winter Sleep sold about 300,000 tickets. Uh, I think I said 100,000. Uh, but one of the reasons why uh, it got more attention was the fact that Haluk Bilginer and Demet Akba feature in this movie. I mean, they are uh, pretty famous actors. Uh, so that might have helped this movie to receive a, 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 a bigger audience. But thank you, Melis, for this correction. One question that I thought uh, would be interesting, I'd love to hear all of your responses to, is someone said that could we consider this film as a comedy in the way that some of Chekhov's plays can be considered comedies? Well, there were many moments when I had a smile watching it. So yes, bitterly so. <laughs> <laughs> bitterly so, almost a comedy. I think there's rich comedy, for example, in the scene in which Aidan reads the begging letter and insists oh. on reading all the flattery to him in the begging letter. And of course, he's not going to read all of it. He's just read several paragraphs of it. You know, it's it's very funny. That's very funny. And I've mentioned the slapstick in the uh, in the train station scene. It's 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 almost a comedy until it's until it's not until the bottom falls out at the end. But I would say it's a comedy in the sense. He, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. He reads the sections that are praising him as a writer. Yes. And then he skips the rest. <laughs> yes. But is this? I, I would imagine we could think of it as a comedy in this. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry again. I would imagine we could think of it as a comedy in the sense that it's a failed tragedy. That he's not a tragic figure. He would like to be a tragic figure, but he's not at all. You know, he's too openly transparent and and things like that. So, um, comedy by default or something like that. It's the Othello Hotel, which is an Othello ominous Hotel. name yeah, you know, for a place, but his wife is not killed at the end. I don't know if she's fully living, but, yeah. um, but he hasn't done her in. Yeah, it's, it's maybe a failed tragedy. So finally, uh, someone asked, uh, for someone who hasn't seen the film before, what would we tell them to look for in the film? It's a wonderful question. <laughs> Shall we say sit back and enjoy the beauty of it to start out with? Mm -hmm. And don't get afraid for the length of the movie. I mean, oh. I know the three hours and 20 minutes might um, seem too long to spend for a movie, uh, but uh, uh, don't get afraid. It's, it's a wonderful experience. And go back to Stuart's um, advice. Try not to watch it on your computer screens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, find the biggest screen you, you can. Um, and though Chelan was ambivalent at best about using that setting, I think you should enjoy it. 
it's it's a remarkable setting. I mean, it's. I guess I would say that I, when I'm asked this sometimes by people, I always say, just watch it. You know, yeah. uh, don't go in with preconceptions, whatever. Just let the film pass over you. And as Tunch said, don't be intimidated by it. You know, I think it's in many ways, although, I mean, I think it's a real achievement. I, I don't it, I don't think it's one of those films where I didn't understand. It. You'll understand everything. In it. And I think you just have to open yourself to it. You know, three hours and 20 minutes is an unusual length nowadays. Although I think some of the Marvel movies seem much longer, <clears throat> yeah. even if they're shorter. Uh, so anyway, I think it's what you should do is really just go in and watch it. And all of you who watch it will uh, identify with or pick up on many more things that none of us spoke about today, because in fact, I think the film is really that rich, that there's still so much more there to be teased out, to be appreciated, and to, in fact, be savored. Yes. Anyway, perhaps on that note, I will thank everybody, especially Stuart Clowans. Stuart, wonderful having you on the panel, and thank, thank you, you for wonderful insights uh and of course Zena and Tunch thank you very much for coming in it was great to have you we really was. learned a lot from your comments no need to be nervous anymore about talking about film <laughs> you passed the test with flying colors no th seriously thank you it was really wonderful having you and of course thanks to everybody who is listening in and uh we hope to see you the next time we have uh, one of these uh upcoming seminars in this series on turkey through cinema thanks everybody bye-bye thank, thank you. you thank you very thank much you.